In this video, we're going to take a look at the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. One of the most amazing books in history and what's so amazing about it is that it has survived for let's face it the better part of a thousand years interestingly though but i want to take a look at what this book is what does it really represent what does it give to us today who live so far distant in time to when this book was written so what is the anglo-saxon chronicle well there's actually a bunch of different versions out there and you may well or may well not be, be aware of that. The reason we have different versions is not just about the translation of the different words by different publishers, but the fact that, is that this book is actually a culmination of the chronicles from the different Anglo-Saxon kingdom. We have a, a very interesting relationship between these different Anglo-Saxon kingdoms and also the, the different challenges that they faced throughout the sort of 600 or so years of Anglo-Saxon history in the United Kingdom, or what is today the United Kingdom. So this book really is uh, an amalgamation, as I say, of those different chronicles. Let's take a little bit of a look at who some of those chronic, what some of those chronicles were. So we have the Winchester Chronicle. We also have the two different Abington Chronicles. There is the Worcestershire and Peterborough Chronicles. There is an Easter Table Chronicle, a Gittonium Chronicle, and finally, a Bilingual Chronicle. Okay, all right. So I guess what makes this such a fascinating document is that it's uh, actually written at the time by people who were there. So. Uh, for example, there's uh, a really interesting account of the so the the so-called Viking raid on the Linders farm, uh, obviously by monks who who survived that raid, and the stories that they would have told in the sort of days and weeks after that raid took place. So we have very contemporary evidence of what actually occurred. Uh, we have uh, entries in this book by all sorts of different uh, Anglo-Saxon nobility, all sorts of different um, key members of the Anglo-Saxon society, and often this was done through, uh, I guess, um, ecclesiastical per personalities. So what does this book give us? Well. I think very much so it's important to understand that it's history that's written by particular individuals from their point of view. So uh, obviously when we write history, when we portray history, when we talk about history, um, we do have a very much a filtered view on that history. Unfortunately, that's human nature, and we can't always, um, and as humans, we tend to struggle to really talk about it from a, I guess, a non-biased perspective. Um, so, for example, um, I think the monks would have given a very skewed perception of the, the Vikings at the time uh, because of their experience with the Vikings. Now, that wasn't always consistent, and it's very interesting. Uh, in fact, the Christian church did enjoy a very positive relationship with the Vikings uh, as the Anglo-Saxon age took hold. So, we have that first Viking raid on Linda's farm and then the Viking raids come through. But after the establishment of... Um, but much later, we do see the Anglo-Saxon... Uh, 
the Christian church um, being something that the Vikings enjoyed quite a good and positive relationship with. And the reason for that was that it gave them, um, I guess, a bit of credibility. It also gave them strength in terms of trade. It gave them political credibility. So there's actually um, a lot of different reasons, very real and legitimate reasons, why the Vikings did in fact convert to Christianity. And many of them did so willingly. Um, many of them did so peacefully. It wasn't just this kind of very violent confrontation that we often tend to see portrayed uh, in, in, in Hollywood or the v various TV shows that are out there. Okay, so let's take a little bit more of a look at what's going on here. So, I guess um, there's a couple of other things that I really want to look at. Number one is um, the limitations of written history like this. So, because this was a book that was, as I say, in many instances written by uh, people from their point of view, I think we also need to understand that um, that not only that gives a, a, a personal bias towards the players who were there, but also it gives a bias to the actual of their description of the event. So I think one of the biggest limiting factors here is not so much the amount of information contained in this book, but um, what I find limiting is the amount of information which is not contained in this book. There's so much which is described in here, but there's, it's actually only really a fragment of Anglo-Saxon society. So, there's so many things that we don't see genuinely described or genuinely recorded. And I think the other part of this that I want to get into is that um, Language as we know it today is very, very different to the concept of language uh, at the time. And what I mean by that is it, only in Victorian times did they start to standardise the spelling of words and they start to standardise the meaning of words. And therefore, names actually have so many different ways to spell them. And sometimes it can be really hard to track individuals through their pages in history. For example, look, um, I think there's about eight different ways that I know of to spell the word boudica. There's about three or four different ways that you can spell the word connect. So, um, there's a lot of limitations there and um, whilst this is a fascinating look into history, uh, it, it, as I say, does come with some, some really sort of uh, interesting limitations too. And, Whilst this is a fantastic primary source of information, it's, it's limiting to use primary source on its own. I think we have to couple primary source with archaeological evidence, with um, iconography from the time, that is things like paintings or murals or carvings. And if we can, back this up with contemporary descriptions. So an example of that would be not only the French descriptions of the raids on Paris, but there were descriptions of the raids on Paris recorded by um, monks and poets from places like Frisia and other areas as well, who gave a, a very interesting, fairly non-biased kind of perspective. And I think that's really quite interesting. Alrighty guys, that's our look at the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles. I really hope you enjoyed today's video. Please like, subscribe and share. And I look forward to catching you in my next video. So let's summarise about these Anglo-Saxon Chronicles. They're an amalgamation of a series of different written accounts throughout the period of the Anglo-Saxons in England. They are, however, biased accounts. In other words, they were sponsored by someone and they're written with a degree of human filtration, if you like. We also know that um, because that they are written with this agenda, we have to compare the evidence and we have to um, look at other contemporary evidence to really 
uh, pull apart the story and find what the truth of the matter is. A really, really good example of this, Aethelred, the Lady of the Mercians. She's hardly even mentioned in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, and it's really hard to understand why. Here is this incredible woman who is a, an absolute genius tactician. She obviously knows how to read a battle. She obviously knows how to be a statesman or woman. She obviously understands diplomacy, and she obviously understands how to listen to her advisors. What was so incredible about this, her achievements is that she was able to get the Vikings uh, to basically surrender and put down weapons without even actually engaging in a fight. And this is incredible given the time period and the fact that the, the Vikings were entrenched in that, uh, had already engaged and uh, settled into that area. Especially when we look at um, what happens at Cheshire, there's, there's her uh, dimension of Athelred in Chester is very, very limited and therefore you have to start looking at sources such as the Irish Chronicles to really gain an understanding of how significant her presence there was. You also need to understand, of course, is that this evidence, as fantastic as it is and as um, you know, unbelievably valuable as it is, is all written with this bias, so it needs to be compared to other contemporary resources. Unfortunately, many of these just don't tell us the whole story, because they're not written for future historians, they're written for the day. They're written to celebrate the, um, the accomplishments of, perhaps it was Alfred the Great, or perhaps it was uh, Edward the Confessor, or whoever it may have been at that particular time. And so, it focuses on, on, on that level, rather than, and so it might say, for example, you know, uh, Alfred's met his nobles and, and they um, discussed a surrender with the Vikings, but rarely does it mention anyone but that very, very top tier and doesn't mention who the scribes were or who the advisors were. It doesn't mention who the earls and the nobles were. It doesn't mention who the leaders were, how many were there, and often doesn't give us a location of the battle. So um, these chronicles are amazing in what they are, but it needs to be remembered what they are and their limitations as well as what they bring to the table. Right, guys, thank you so much for watching. Please like, subscribe, and share. I'll catch you in my next video.